Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 474, Survey Says... This episode of Craft Lit is brought to you by HelloFresh. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, please visit HelloFresh.com and enter the promo code CRAFTLIT30. That's CRAFTLIT30. Well, hello! Welcome back! I hope you are excited to hear what everyone has to say, because, because you all have things to say about The Count of Monte Cristo. And why shouldn't you? What a great book! And it only took 70 episodes <laughs> to get through thousands of pages. Uh, Anne of Green Gables will go by more quickly, I promise. There's also considerably less researching that has to go into Anne of Green Gables. Of course, that doesn't mean that there won't be researching that will go into Anne of Green Gables, just less that is absolutely necessary. So I'm looking forward to that, I have to admit. Before we get to everybody's comments, I did want to let you know I will have a Jughead hat update for you shortly. I am now sewing up the seams, and we all know how much fun that is. So it's coming, but you may have to wait a little bit to see the finished product. But it sure was an easy pattern to to do. It just, it's you know, it's easy to memorize, easy to do. I love it. Well, last week you got to hear the melodious voices of things one and two, which you may have heard more of if you've been listening to the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcasts and audio shows. And they'll continue to be popping up as different characters on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights episodes from here on out, as far as I can tell, which is kind of fun to get to do with the kids. They often get to play my kids, which is also fun. And yeah, if you haven't listened to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, they just did the Evil Idol contest. And I was a judge for it. It was so much fun to listen to people who wanted to either get into audiobook narrating or people who wanted to get into just doing audio character work. They had these opportunities and it was very much like American Idol where the listeners got to vote and then we, the judges, got to vote and the scores were combined. And I was really impressed with the the finalists. So if you've, if you've ever wanted to hear a whole lot of creepy stories. And again, these aren't like slashery, gross stories for the most part. And I say for the most part because the Evil Idol contest was a little bit different than the regular Chilling Tales Fair. I think you have a ton of opportunities for late night listening and chilling yourself to the core over at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. And I'll go ahead and link to that as well as link to one of my favorite readers. He didn't win, but he was in the top five. And he He has a voice where from the first second you hear it, you go, ah, irony and sarcasm. (laughs) My kind of guy. He just was hysterical. So I'm linking out to his, his final entry into the competition called The Devil Game. His name is Nikolai Porter and it it links out to his, um, the, the YouTube version of the audio. So should be easy enough for you to listen to if you want. Enjoy. You're welcome. <laughs> a, little, a little humor in a post-Halloween world. But I started off by talking about thing one and thing two. You won't hear from them today, but you will hear about one of the foods that had the biggest impact on them. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the food delivery service that I got to try out with my kids. And boy, was it a big hit. So one of the things, especially heading into the holiday season that I know people are concerned about with something like this, where it's a subscription service, is, well, what do I do if I'm not at home? And the answer is you can pause your account for weeks if you're out of town and all of it's handled online, really easy to do. They also allow you online, kind of like the Evil Idol competition, to vote for your favorites. So when you are planning what kinds of shipments you want in the future. You can also look up notable recipes. You know, recipes, they have what they call the Juicy Lucy Burger that has a tomato onion jam, arugula salad on the side, 
And the tomato onion jam is making me salivate because I know how good the fig jam sauce was on the chicken that we made. This week, though, I'm going to tell you about the big surprise. And that was creamy mushroom pork chops. I don't like mushrooms. My kids don't like mushrooms. Nobody in my immediate family likes mushrooms. But I thought, okay, if you can sell me on a mushroom sauce, that will truly impress me. And again, this is a meal that can be made in 30 minutes or less, and it's healthy, and it has all of the breakdowns for the calorie content and the nutritional content on the recipe card. And the recipe cards aren't small. I mean, it's an eight and a half by 11 type sheet of um, cardstock. You know, it's, it's good. It's thick. It doesn't matter if it gets wet because it's kind of laminated a little bit. The shiny paper. And as if that weren't enough, the whole shebang, and I mean, this is, it's a really beautiful meal, was made with one cast iron skillet and one roasting pan. The roasting pan was for the potatoes and the Brussels sprouts, which I've never really liked before, but I do now. And the roasting pan took care of those two things so that on the stovetop, while those were cooking, I was focused on getting the pork chops right. So in the box for this one, I got the Brussels sprouts, I got the potatoes, I got shallot, I got the button mushrooms, fresh parsley, pork chops, sour cream packets, and veggie stock concentrate packets. Now the balsamic fig chicken, you know, you kind of figure if you put really good balsamic vinegar together with anything, especially something sweet like a little fig jelly, that that would, that would probably taste pretty good. For someone like me, again, not a huge fan of mushrooms. I did decide to augment this one recipe a little bit, but that's because I knew my boys. My boys will eat anything, at least they'll try it, as long as there are caramelized onions on hand. So I did start off by caramelizing some Vidalia onions, and I figured that at least I know they'll eat with the meat because I didn't trust HelloFresh, which was kind of silly on my part. So I followed their instructions. I got the potatoes and the Brussels sprouts in the oven. That was all great. Prepped the rest of the ingredients, cooked the pork the way they did because I was a little paranoid. I had my little temperature thermometer in and that made it easy to tell how hot everything was on the inside. So I didn't overcook it. It turned out that their cooking instructions, the number of minutes were correct, which also tells me that I had my burner set to the correct-ish temperature. Because you know how it'll say medium high heat or medium low heat, but that's not exactly what it says on the dial. Apparently I got it right this time. So that was great. Cook the pork chops, take them out, make the sauce. Now I had removed the Vidalia onions from the pan. So at this point I am making the recipe exactly the way it is written. And it doesn't take long before it really started to smell good. And I started to think, wow, maybe, maybe 50 isn't so old. <laughs> Maybe you really can change your opinions about things, even at this late date. I I was drooling before I ever got the meal on the plate. When I finally plated everything up, I did add the Vidalia onions back in because, again, I know the boys. And last week when Thing One was talking about having eaten his father's portion of the food, he, he wasn't just talking about the fig chicken. He was also talking about the creamy mushroom pork chops. They were so good, and the potatoes were really good, and the Brussels sprouts were really good, and nothing had, just like I said last week with the the salad dressing, nothing had a super heavy sauce, nothing felt fattening or overweight or cloying or greasy or any of that stuff. I didn't have to fake it to get the kids to eat it. You know, I didn't have to take something that would have been healthy and make it unhealthy in order to get them to chow down on this stuff. It's so good. Now, if you decide to try this out, there are three different meal plans to choose from. There's classic, there's veggie, and there's family. Classic is a variety of meat and fish and seasonal produce, which is great. Vegetarian, obviously. They have plant-based and grain-based foods that still provide you with the amount of protein that you need. So if you are newly vegetarian, this is a really important thing to learn how to cook with. And then the family version is quick and easy meals that are, as you can tell, just so good. And one of my favorite things about this was that it didn't take me long to clean up because I had the roasting pan and I had a pot and I'd already cleaned off the cutting board. So done. So what did I learn? <laughs> I learned that in around 30 minutes, I could make 
a really, really good meal, that like restaurant worthy meal. But I also learned that by being given the right ingredients and a tried and true recipe, I could push my own limits and eat outside of my comfort zone, you know, trying things that I hadn't tried before. And it feels like there's no risk involved. The box is there. The food is there. Cook it up. People have said it tastes great. And apparently these people are smart because it was so true. It's not like going to a restaurant where you're investing money in food and you don't necessarily want to try something new because you don't know how good it's going to be. And all of this, all of this is so easy to do with dinners that come in around around or less than $10 a meal. You can't do that at a good restaurant. So if you are interested in trying this out for $30 off of your first week of HelloFresh, you go to HelloFresh.com and you enter the promo code CRAFTLIT30. That's CRAFTLIT30. And try this sucker out for yourself and let me know what you think. You can always call at area code 206 350 1642 and share your ideas and opinions about the book. Or you can let me know what you thought about your HelloFresh food because I want to know what recipes you liked now that I've told you which ones I liked. All right. So it's so happy to have a great sponsor for the show. <laughs> little things in life that make it all worthwhile. All right, let's hear from you now and what you have been thinking about the Count of Monte Cristo. Here we go. Hi, Heather. It's Julie Davis here. And first, I want to thank you for getting me through the Count of Monte Cristo, which I tried before, but always sagged off in the middle. And what a great book. My goodness. And you stuck with it forever. Good for you. And I feel proud for getting through it, too. Anyway, I did want to say I was so struck by toward the end of the book when the Count of Monte Cristo says, well, I thought I was doing God's vengeance, but dang, this is not working out like I thought. And that was the first moment, I think, when he articulated he was acting for God. I always thought he was just acting for himself, his own vengeance. And of course, it's very convenient when you think that your vengeance and God's vengeance are the same thing. So the point when everything starts going wrong, when he's like, yeah, Valentine, whatever. Wait, you love him? holy moly, I got to fix this. That's when he starts seeing that he is not in line with what God wanted. Taking this back to when you noted all the the resemblances to Christ, uh, you know, the falling in the water, the baptism, the coming out, the being reborn. Of course, at the end, it's a different sort of revelation. But what we see, of course, is that the count is not all-knowing, all-powerful. He is not God, and this is what he is realizing himself. So we see his own development, his own rebirth to new life, as he himself has had to practice patience and hope, because a day is waiting for him. This is the new life he did not expect. I really liked the way that was woven in with his realization and his kinder treatment of Danglar, who I feel sure he would have been happy to have starved to death. But what we did see also is in each case, he's kind of acting as the tempter. He's putting all the bad ideas into their head and seeing what they'll do with them. This is not really, you know, God's way. So he also has to come to this realization. He just puts the idea in people's heads and sees what they do with them. And according to their bad natures, they do bad things, but it hurts everyone around them. The way he turns to with Donglar isolates Donglar Let's everybody else have their own free will also. Anyway, thanks again. Loved it, loved it, loved it, and I appreciate all you do. Hey, Heather, it's Lise, um, Knitting Rose, and I'm calling about Cattle Monte Cristo, of course. Um, I loved the second to the last chapter. I loved the way Dunglar's punishment went. I think it was very appropriate. I think it was not as much punishment for Dunglar as it was redemption for the Count. He understood that revenge was hurting him, 
that was hurting him. And what was the best thing to happen was forgiveness. And that was the only way he could heal, too. I really think he understood that at the at the end there, that the vengeance and the revenge that he had had killed the child, Edward, and he needed to let that go. And in, the only way to let that go was through forgiveness. And that's the only way he could have moved forward in life with Haiti. If he hadn't done that, he would never have been able to go forward in life with Haiti. I think their relationship is a very strange companionship that's born out of despair and the vengeance that they shared. I don't think anyone else ever could have understood the other, and I think that it's beautiful that they went away together, the age difference notwithstanding. I'm thrilled that Morel was finally happy with Valentine. I think that's beautiful, and I think it's beautiful there, too, that, that Valentine was the daughter of an enemy, and yet he wanted her happiness. And that was part of the forgiveness. That was part of the beauty in this book that he had to find. I enjoyed it. It was a long book. It was a long trek. It was quite quite interesting in some days where, where I couldn't remember what happened and I had to go back. But overall, this was great. Thanks so much for doing what you do. Bye. It's Ken from Honolulu again. It's interesting in the Count of Monte Cristo, you were talking about themes and whatnot, but the, he does not always have the bad guys getting theirs. Cavalcanti, he got away with all kinds of bad stuff. He murdered somebody. He robbed people. He did all kinds of stuff. But he was he got a, uh, as far as we know he got away with it because of what he the revelations that he brought up for Deville for. So not everybody gets theirs. And it was intimated that he may be getting off. So, you know, and when Edmund gave um, Mercedes that place to live, he felt bad after she explained because he said, you know, well, you know, you left me and you didn't wait. And she, she basically said, she said to him straight out, she says, but what was I supposed to do? She says, I had no money. I was going to starve. So I had to do what I had to do. And that's where he came to really feel for her. So everybody just didn't get theirs, you know. And he says, yeah, okay, I understand, you know, that you had to do. Because in his life, he had to do what he had to do to get where he was. To be a powerful crime boss is what he was, and a very rich one at that. So... The, the themes in his in his story are really good, you know, that you – not everybody gets theirs, and not everybody gets what they're hoping to get. But those who walk the straight line can usually, you know, like Valentin and Morel, they walk the straight line. They did what they were supposed to do, and at the end, they got, they got something really good. And, yes, Edmund did not go off broke. He went off with his millions and his crime syndicate, whatever you want to call it. And so he was not a good guy, even though it tries to make him out to be a good guy. He he still had his fingers in all the crime and everything else. So, you know, not everybody is a good guy, and not everybody gets what they're supposed to get. Again, thank you very much for doing the book. It was so much fun. Aloha. Hi, Heather. It's Caroline, a.k.a. Fiddle Twist, calling in about The Count. Um, I found it much more entertaining than I thought it would. I had a hard time struggling through the prison chapters, but it got a whole lot more interesting once Edmond was out of prison and he wasn't just being put upon. I was just thinking that this book reminded me a little bit of The Woman in White in that it was one of those pot-boiling page-turners that you just can't stop reading. At least that's how I felt about it by the end. I did feel as though the ending was a little bit almost rushed, that he dragged out the whole is he dead or is he not dead thing with Maximilian. But then once that was all resolved, it was almost like the Count and Haiti just ran off stage as fast as they could go, and we were all left behind going, wait, what? So it was funny that he dragged out every little thing all the way through the book, and then he rushed through that last thing that happened. At least that's the way it felt to me. But I enjoyed the book a lot more than I thought I would, and someday I might actually 
uh, by the reading that's on Audible, BJ's reading, just to hear it read by somebody completely different. Looking forward to what comes next with Craftlet. Thanks. Bye. Hi, Heather. It's Tara. I have not been listening to The Count of Monte Cristo because I got kind of aggravated with the slow build and slow burn of it. I am now going back, and I'm on episode 450, and there was a call from our resident male lady listener, and she had mentioned uh, a question she had about the baby that was born and set in the orphanage. What happened from, or I think not what happened, but what doctors say about people now who come in who are seemingly dead from hypothermia, being out in the elements too long, or being frozen, is you're not dead until you're warm and dead. What happens is is they warm the body back up so that if it can revive and come back to consciousness, it happens. So, again, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. I thought it was an interesting fact to mention. I don't know if it's been mentioned on episodes afterwards because I'm just catching up. So I hope you're having a fantastic day. I listened to the Halloween special. It was amazing to hear from Thing 1 and Thing 2. Holy poop, your tiny humans are now tiny men persons. It's totally weird. Make them stop doing that. They're getting too old too fast. Hey, this is Jan Lee, um, Nits and Hikes on Ravelry. I was just, so the Count of Monte Cristo has just kissed AD on the forehead and they're, and he's, he's, you know, maybe things are going to be okay. Maybe I have this chance of love. And, um, it reminded me that you said something I meant to ask you about, about, um, Jefferson and Sally Hemings, I think was her last name. I, I know about this vaguely because I read a fiction book that talked about them having a relationship and having children together. And I have heard other people reference that like it's a fact, but I've never run across the actual, like, this is how we proved that this was happening references. So I'm wondering, number one, if you if you have those, because um, about a, it's been within the last month, and I have to go back and double-check some of the podcasts that I've been listening to besides Craftlet because I'm pretty sure that it was one of those. Someone else had referenced this. Um, affair and then had said that it had been proven incorrect or that it had been proven that it didn't actually happen. And, but they also spoke about it like everyone should know this and did not give references. So I'm going to follow up on that section or on that particular part. But I was wondering if you could follow up or let me know where your references are for Sally Hemings and um, Thomas Jefferson having an affair and having children. Because um, like now I'm confused because <laughs> I've gotten two different people that I, I – you know, trust is being reputable, telling me two different things, and now I want to run that down. So, but um, it, I'm interested to see what happens with AD if, he, when he releases her, gives her her freedom, if she stays because she feels obligated, or if she does fall in love with him, or if something happens with Mercedes and um, Edmund and then out there and AD end up together. I don't know, but um, or you know, if they all go off happily alone, I guess that would be fine too. But yeah, thank you again for Craft. I, I I know I see this every time I call in, but I so enjoy the thought provoking things that you that you bring up. Anyway, thanks. Bye. Hi Heather, this is Jennifer or Curious Kitty on Ravelry. And I just finished listening to the last chapter of The Count of Monte Cristo. Now I have to say that I've listened to this book a couple of times because I'm a huge fan of audiobooks and audible. But when I saw that you were doing it, I got really excited for the annotated uh, version to to be able to enhance my experience in it. And I was very pleased that I did so because there were lots of things that I've learned and there were lots of things I had no idea. And I think I must have fallen asleep through some of them because there are some areas that I'm like, I don't remember that. But I just wanted to comment because I just finished it and I wanted to comment on the revenge for Danglar. And how it kind of, at first, it kind of fell flat. Like, you know, he did all these things to these three other, you know, conspirators. And with Danglar, he just kind of, like, gave up. And then I thought about it, and I thought about all the time that had passed, from the time that he got out of the Chateau d'If and planned all these things. He's been living and breathing this for years and I think that he probably just reached a point where he just had to say, when is enough enough? And I think he finally reached that point with Don Glar and letting him 
you know, experience being in the bandit's hands, but also to be able to leave there with, you know, the money that was so important to him. He left with that 50000 leave, or Louis, or Franck's. I, the money gets a little confusing, but I thought that that was very realistic in a way and that it really showed his emotional intelligence that he was able to say, you know, enough is enough. I'm I'm done. And I think that that was pretty fantastic. Probably one of the best moments in the book. So that's my two cents worth. You're doing a great job. I'm enjoying listening to your podcast, all of them, and uh, keep up the great work. Hey, Heather and Craftlet listeners. Um, this is Catherine, Cass VS on Ravelry. Um, wanted to call about the Count of Monte Cristo. Um, and just a thought and some thoughts I've been having overall. I had never read the book before. Um, and my whole view of the story was that it was some revenge story that I wasn't particularly interested in. But quite a few years ago, I had been flipping the stations on TV one night and caught the last 10, 15 minutes of the most recent adaptation um, of movie adaptation of this story. So I thought I knew how the story ended, and I was waiting for this big reveal to come. And the further along we got in the end of the book, I thought, how are they going to work this in? This is not going down the path that I expected, but, you know, it must be coming somehow. So I waited and I waited, and the closer we got to the end, the more I could see where the book was going, but I thought, no, the movie told me that this big reveal was going to happen. And my mind and heart was telling me the story was going one way, but the movie was telling me that it was going someplace else. And I have to say that last chapter was something like disappointing. It was um, kind of squidgy and yicky feeling like we you had discussed on your podcast. And it just seemed like I had been ready for one thing and I got something else. Um, even though the book was heading in that direction the whole way, I, 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 I should have seen it coming. But just want to say I cannot believe that the movie changed the story so much. I should expect it. Movies do it all the time. But really, that was a totally different story. So that was my thoughts. Um, it, it wasn't the story I thought it was going to be. I enjoyed it. Um, it certainly was long, but it was entertaining. And movies, really, I shouldn't watch them before I read a book. I normally don't. But, you know, it happens. Hi, Heather and everyone. This is Amy, A-I-M-E-E, crochets on Ravelry. I have I called in earlier on in the book a bunch of times talking about the differences between the abridged version that I've read so many times and the unabridged version that we all just finished. And I haven't called in a long time, mostly because most of the changes were early on in the story. So it was really neat to sit and listen, and, and there were some conversations that were left out of the latter half of the book in the abridged version, but for the most part, all the action made it in. And it was just neat to see it, to have it going along, knowing what was going to happen, listen to everyone go, oh, does the count going to be remorseful or isn't he even knowing what was coming? Was It was really neat. It's like, it's like watching your favorite episode um, of Doctor Who with a friend who hasn't seen it before and waiting for the reveal. So that's been a lot of fun, Heather. Thank you so much for taking us through my very favorite book in a new-to-me way. I am definitely going out and buying myself an unabridged version now. I just have to figure out which translation to get. So thanks again. I can't wait until our next book happens. I hope it's Anne of Green Gables because I've never read it. Shock and horror. I know. I was a little house on the prairie girl and never heard of Anne of Green Gables until I was an adult. So I'm so looking forward to that happening. Have a great week, a great month, and I look forward to the Halloween special. Thanks. Bye. Hi, Heather. This is Lori in Northern California. Lori1176 on Ravelry and a longtime listener of Craftlet. I have loved listening to The Count of Monte Cristo. I don't think I ever would have read it if it weren't for your serialized version. I was listening to it on a walk today, the first day that I was able to actually get out and enjoy a relatively smoke-free day in Northern California, even though I am more than 80 miles away from the terrible fires that are burning here. 
I wanted to comment on the last chapter, which I thought was terrific and really brought everything together in a way that I didn't think was trite at all. I really liked the the words of the Count, live then and be happy, beloved children, blah, 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 summed up in these two words, wait and hope. And I think your words, be patient and be optimistic, are, are even better. Uh, and I'm sure it depends on the translation. But in these times of hurricanes and mass shootings and devastating fires and that he who shall not be named in the White House, I think the best we can do is be patient and be optimistic. And that is the tack I choose to take. So I wanted to thank you for doing this podcast. I really have enjoyed all of the books, but this one in particular. And I also wanted to thank the reader, David Clark, who I think did a fantastic job of keeping us engaged in this book all the way through. So thanks and looking forward to the next book. Thank you so much for writing and calling in and sending in your thoughts and ideas about The Count of Monte Cristo. I'm so glad we listened to this book together. I'm so glad that Julie Davis listened to this book, as is her daughter, Rose, because Rose liked the book. Julie didn't think she would. So now Julie and I are one in one because I read A Tale of Two Cities because she promised me I would love it, and I did. And Rose and I convinced her that The Count of Monte Cristo was worth listening to, and clearly she agrees as well. And now she's trying to get me to read Ivanhoe, so we'll see how that goes. (laughs) I wanted to let you know before I let you go that this year I will be doing the Craftlet 12 Days of Christmas once again with all new stories for you to listen to and enjoy as you putter around in those last days before Christmas. They'll be family-friendly. They will be short, probably short stories. And uh, and it'll give you something to look forward to day to day before the big event. That'll take us into the new year. And in the new year, we will start Anne of Green Gables. And that should be kind of fun for you. I also have some special guests coming up in the Anne of Green Gables world and I'm excited about sharing them with you as well. Don't forget to visit our sponsor for this episode, HelloFresh at HelloFresh.com using promo code CRAFTLIT30, CRAFTLIT30 to get $30 off on your shipment. All right, you take care of yourself. I will talk to you soon. Have a great one. Take care. Bye. A big thanks to all the CraftLit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via CraftLit.com slash premium or via Patreon.com slash CraftLit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to Patreon.com slash CraftLit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlet page or follow at craftlet on twitter and share the show with your followers too and remember if your hands are too busy to pick up a book at least you can turn one on <laughs>